Good morning and welcome to the Founders Games of the Webit Global Impact Week, uh, the startup competition gathering founders from the four corners of the world to showcase and present their innovative ideas to a curated group of investors, hoping to win their hearts, minds, and pockets. The competition has become an investment platform for matchmaking hand-picked early stage startups and venture round scale-ups with investors, corporates, and media. It all started 13 years ago when Webit joined the ecosystem and was among the first to, to start connecting the startup and the enterprise worlds together. You can find us and share your thoughts and questions on social media with the hashtag Webit. With no further ado, let's get to the competition. All right, so the first session is the clean tech and smart energy. So a big welcome to the investors and jury members that are presenting, uh, that the startups will be presenting to this morning. And we want to introduce our first panel of the day. So starting with Arthur, he's a partner at Movens VC. How are you? So I'm great. Thank you, Jonathan. Great to have you. Welcome. All right, and coming back uh, for day two, we've got Claudius Stambach, investment manager at Sparrow Ventures. How are you, Claudius? I'm fine as well. Good morning, everyone. Excellent, thank you. And last but not least, we have Francesca Cavana, innovation team lead at Mind the Bridge. How are you this morning? Amazing, thank you. Thank you for having me here today. Awesome, so good to see all of you and thank you for being a part of this. I um, want to review the rules really quickly. So each startup has three minutes to present the video that they've prepared beforehand. Once that video is finished, we're going to open up the floor for about five minutes for Q&A from the jury. And so the jury will be asking any questions and uh, making any comments um, for that specific startup. So the jury has the important task to provide their evaluation and ask any questions that will help in that decision process. So they're gonna be evaluating five milestones on a scale from one to 10. Uh, that Those milestones are team capacity, project scalability, business approach, marketing approach, and the uniqueness of the idea. So we will wrap up with reflections after all of the star startups have presented and we'll have a uh, Q&A feedback session that will last around 10 minutes. So. Now that everyone understands the rules, we are ready to begin with the first startup. So um, coming from the Netherlands, we have Ecotree. Um, they've raised in their round A about 3 million euros. And Ecotree is a simple and groundbreaking way to reward companies and individuals supporting sustainable forestry. Let's check out their video. Hi, I'm Thomas from Ecotree. From the latest IPCC report to the EU Green Deal to the common sense, it's all pointing towards more trees and more sustainable forestry ecosystems. And we should put that on top of our social, political, corporate, individual agenda for the years and the decades to come if we want to be able to plant those very much needed billions of trees. So at Ecotree, we've come up with a model where we can engage everyone, individuals and companies, in planting more trees and supporting um, sustainable forestry. We're using the proven method of financial incentive to get people and organizations turn their good intentions into concrete, immediate action. Since Ecotree launched in 2016, we've managed to plant and are taking care of more than a million trees. And we want to push that figure up to 10 million by the end of 2030. But honestly, the real heroes in this story are our 55,000 clients, individual clients, and our 1,500 company clients. The way it works is pretty simple. We've made it possible for anyone, individuals or companies, to buy newly planted trees from our forests in Europe. So while your tree grows, it will deliver its natural environmental benefits and take financial value of your time. When it reaches maturity and it makes sense to give room to f new trees with fresh potential, uh, we're going to selectively cut the trees and your tree and hand over 100% of the timber revenue to you. 
This is the financial incentive I mentioned. On the way, and here comes the tech side, we are developing continuously a digital universe so that you can actually track and follow your tree's growth online using IoT sensors, camera time lapses, um, and even developing features like satellite or drone imagery so that you can, from a bird view perspective, kind of monitor um, the growth of the biomass happening on the ground. In a nutshell, a tree in an ecotree forest pays for itself, both delivering very concrete, tangible, environmental benefits and creating a green asset on the side. Because I believe this is the future of sustainability. It's not just about being ecologically sustainable, but also economically sustainable. That's how we're going to achieve the real impact. So the good news is it's happening now on ecotree.green. Join our community and may the forest be with you. All right, great. So we are going to open up uh, the question round. And I think we have Thomas here with us. Welcome. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. So um, from the jury, who wants to go first? I can go. Awesome. Uh, I have one question for you. So um, I saw like you mentioned that mainly your customer is like a B2C model. Do you also have something like B2B? So are you also proposing some kind of packages for, for business? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, um, last year we, were, we reached a kind of a 50-50 split between the B2B and B2C segment. And what we've noticed that uh, we're already on our domestic market, France, or on the inter new international markets we've addressed since. It always starts, the first traction starts on the B2C segment, which is somehow easier to convert with some digital marketing and so forth. Um, and then quickly um, the B2B segment takes over. And uh, we expect actually for the couple of years that um, the B2B segment will represent um, yeah, 60 to 75% of our revenue. Thank you. I have a quick question regarding the reward. So let's say I personally would pay, let's say a thousand euros for, for, for planting such trees. What reward can I expect and in which time frame? I mean, a plea that takes, I mean, even decades to, to grow. So uh, is it more like, what I want to say is it more on a financial return for the planter or is it about uh, offsetting in form of a tree? Well, it's, uh, you're right, it's, a, it's a definitely a long-term perspective. So we'd prefer to talk about a financial incentive uh, than, a, than a pure financial product as such. And the primary motivation of our customer is actually environmental. But uh, it's this financial incentive on top of it that makes it more, more appealing. Um, so it is indeed a long-term perspective, uh, and you can expect a 2% uh, financial gain per year. Uh, this is something we have uh, validated with the French financial authorities, where we are duly registered. And they, of course, monitor uh, and, and control very strictly what we're doing. So it, it's, um, and it's based, that growth, that financial gain is based on the, on the production of wood and a tree on average, it's not linear, but on average grows between two to 4% a year. So um, we take the conservative approach of you know, expecting a perspective of 2% per year, which you materialize, of course, at the end of the, the tree's life cycle. Indeed. Okay, thank you. And, and when it comes to, maybe uh, to answer your second question, um, when it comes to the carbon sequestration, it's a kind of an add-on, um, an additional benefit that you get um, where actually, you know, or whatever, instead of buying carbon credits, which is a cost on your, on your PNL, you can have a very tangible, verified carbon sequestration or carbon removal, as we call it, uh, that becomes an asset on your balance sheet. So it will, uh, yeah, we call it the carbon removal that pays for itself. Great. Excellent. Thomas, uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, uh, I've learned recently that uh, the trees can be also one of the most uh, uh, efficient uh, as asset class, in fact. So this is, uh, it sounds like a, <laughs> it's very, very interesting uh, business model. Uh, can, can, can you say uh, how do you really plant that uh, and uh, how do you care about uh, the, the trees? And 
is is there any risk at the individual uh, uh, level of, of your investors or clients that if if part of uh, the trees is for example destroyed uh, or, or, or sick or something uh, has happened uh, how do you want to address it yeah this is a, this is a good question which we actually get frequently <clears throat> Maybe three things I, I wanted to say. First is like, we are actually a forestry company initially, uh, a tech okay. and a forestry company. I like to say we are a startup that started in a, not in a garage for once, but in a forest. Um, and it's so uh, those projects are on our land and uh, with our own team, right? So we're not a middleman that is kind of outsourcing something in some other parts of the world. We take care of so, you know, it. It's our, our stuff we're taking care of. Um, second is that, in the pricing you pay when you purchase the tree, roughly uh, 30% covers the, like the costing, the operations. Uh, we have ourselves a 30% margin. That's where we make money because again, the timber goes 100% to our customers. Um, and so the remaining 40% on the price you're paying um, goes on sort of an escrow account for to secure the long-term financial resources so that you'll make sure that your tree will actually turn into a forestry ecosystem because there will be at least financial resources to make that happen. And this is the best guarantee that you will actually have those tangible uh, environmental benefits. And when it comes to the, the risk you mentioned, well, yes, indeed, it is a natural asset. Uh, so there are some natural hazards um, and there, there's no zero risk. And we are always very clear with our customer about this. But um, most of the natural hazards are covered by a uh, specialized insurance we are taking. Um, ex so fire, storm, you know, uh, flooding, all that is kind of covered by an insurance. Um, what's not covered is diseases and drought, like drying out. Uh, but those two risks, we mitigate the first one by actually mixing spaces, the type of, I mentioned, sustainable forestry. It's a technique called close to nature forestry, which involves, among other guidelines, involves- I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna, have, to, I'm gonna have to jump in, my apologies. But we've, we've ended the, the five Oh, minutes. the timing, okay. Yes, sir. Um, no, no, but so so we're we insured most, for most of the risk, basically. That was my point. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent job. Very interesting concept as well. And uh, and thank you again for being here, Thomas. My pleasure, thank we'll you. We'll have uh, five to 10 minutes. If anyone or any of the, the judges have uh, additional questions, we can go back and, and ask the, the, the startups then as well. But thank you guys. Brilliant. Next thank up, you so much. We have, you're welcome. Next up, we have EcoFi coming from the UK. So they're a pre-seed company a clean tech startup that enables companies to solve all their sustainability needs in one place. Let's check out their video. Hi everyone, my name is Aniela and I am the co-founder and CEO of EcoFi. And at EcoFi, we help companies to solve all their sustainability needs in one place. When it comes to reducing emissions, we always hear about the big companies, but in the UK, small and medium businesses represent 50% of all business emissions. These companies are pressured by consumers to take action, yet 98% still fail to implement impactful changes. This has made sustainability one of the biggest challenges of the coming decade. So why is this happening? At the moment, small and medium companies face a dilemma. They can either hire a consultant, which is too expensive and slow, or use online tools, which are too generic and low impact. We are developing the first platform that not only rates ESG sustainability performance for small and medium companies, but also provides them with autonomous and personalized sustainability solutions for them to improve, making it simpler, faster, and cheaper. So let's have a look at this example. Nicole owns a juice company, and she recently joined our platform. With our platform, she understood which business area she should focus on first, allowing her to save time and money. After completing the assessment, our platform autonomously created solutions specifically for her juice company. Nicole can now implement any change at her own time and with real measurable impact. And what about greenwashing? We avoid greenwashing by requesting documents and proof of action. Our algorithm analyzed Nicole's entire value chain and provided her with an sustainability ESG score based on three criteria, carbon emissions, circular economy, and social impact. So how do we make money? We adopted a freemium model where any company can sign up and get an ESG sustainability score. 
And the more companies we welcome on our platform, the more accurate the solutions become. This is why the freemium model is so important. The solutions and the carbon footprint come at a premium price per year. And because we believe that increasing collaboration and transparency is vital to reduce the effects of climate change, for our next feature, we want to allow companies to trade waste between industries. All of this coordinated by machine learning. To develop the VETA version, we were funded by a grant from Innovate UK, and we won a sustainability award with Lamborghini, which secures a pilot project with them. We launched in June this year and have onboarded over 20 users across the fast-moving consumer goods sectors. Our advisors come from companies such as Cisco, Lamborghini, and Google. We're looking to raise 1.2 million pounds to accelerate our growth. If you want to create a future you're proud of, join us today. Thank you. Excellent. We actually have Daniela here with us in studio. So who has questions for her? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Any questions from the jury for okay, Daniela? Let me, let, me, let me go first then. Um, hi, Daniela. Uh, nice to meet you. One question from my side. It was not really clear from the presentation how do, do you analyze like the, the different uh, KPI to, to put it inside your, your algorithm, your program. So <clears throat> the way that it works is the company joins the platform and they answer a survey that adjusts to depending on the answers that they have. So for example, let's say from Chicago, you have like a coffee company and you want to make it more sustainable and you don't know where to start. So you join our platform, you start answering and the questions will adapt to you. And this is where we evaluate um, your sustainability performance and then the solutions and the carbon calculator come after. So basically- okay. the, What yes. if I don't have the data that you are requesting in the platform? So it's like, are the question very technical, very specific, uh, how this can be like a, a extended to different business? Because I guess that for each kind of business, like the, the sustainable related KPI are, are very different. That's a good question. Uh, we are currently only focusing in the fast moving consumer goods sector, and we're only focusing in SMEs, uh, small and medium companies. And uh, well, most of the questions that we ask, the company will have them. But if you don't have the question, we won't penalize you for that. We will just, uh, you know, give you an opportunity to put it in the future or allow you for you to take action if you don't have an answer for that question. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Any additional questions? All right. Well, so the, the, uh, just uh, in, in, in the same, uh, the, the question in the same, same space. So uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, the, uh, so so do, do, you, do you consider have, having, a, 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 or do you see the need of having a, an a external uh, data, data source or automatic collection of, uh, an, uh, from any data points? So, or, the, or you want to base on, only on the questionnaires? No, we, um, the reason we want to expand to make it easier for companies to calculate all this data. So this is why we have the, uh, an advisor from Cisco to allow IoT sensors and also get some um, information from existing um, software, some through some APIs. Um, but yeah, so the initial questionnaire is like is like this, and also our goal through market is through financial institutions. So we also want to see how we can use existing data, for example, from transactions to evaluate the stability performance of companies. But at the moment, for the beta version, it's through a questionnaire. But this is something that we're working on in the future. Okay. Okay. Fine. Thank you. And uh, and uh, you said that uh, uh, the reason to that uh, uh, to have a freemium model is that uh, you, so you you have a kind of uh, I understand network effect. The more data you have, the, the better uh, results you can uh, uh, output you can have. So how does it work? Uh, why more data here creates bigger value? So for the, the companies have always a choice for them to add a new option. Um, so we welcome our fifth paying user because we already have paying users. And it was again, another coffee company. So for example, the first one we did some assumptions based on the, on the things that we know in the project that we have worked on. And 
The second company, when they were completing the survey, there were some things that the first one didn't choose. So giving the second additionally uh, materials that they use, then the third company is going to have the assumptions from the first and the second one. So it's like a learning um, algorithm. Like so more, the more companies we have, the more accurate the solutions become. And our really our vision is to allow companies to trade waste because because eighty percent of the emissions of companies are based in the scope three, which is mostly the supply chain. And if we can reduce this, we will really make a great impact. And this is why we launched Echo Five. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniela. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Awesome. Good luck. And next up, we have What Now coming from Tunisia. So they're a post seed company. They've raised about 450,000 euros so far. What Now is a smart energy management solution designed to help companies take control of their energy using an AI powered IoT solution. Here's their presentation You can't change what you can't measure. And that's exactly what what now does. It helps you change what you now can measure. Hi, everybody. I'm going to talk to you about what now, a Tunisian IoT smart energy management solution. Companies today need to deal with wasted energy that can sometimes reach 30% in certain sectors. And at the same time, they're suffering because of high maintenance costs. So at what now, we help companies optimize their energy usage in order to reduce costs and their carbon footprint. To give you a few numbers, what now, it's five years of research and development. It's $500,000 raised since 2018, and it's more than $500,000 of revenue since launch. We're also proud to have investors coming from Tunisia, Egypt, Japan, Oman, France, and our latest one from Norway, Catapult, an impact investor. So what now, it's an IT solution combining hardware and software. Our devices will collect real-time energy data, control and automate loads, and everything can be accessed and visualized on a user-friendly dashboard and mobile app. And all of this is to help you take control of your energy, thanks to real-time energy monitoring via alerts when faults or saving opportunities happen, thanks to action control, and of course, through reports and analytics. So by helping companies better manage their energy usage, we're trying to make an impact by playing our part in mitigating climate change by acting on UN SDG 7, 11, and 13. At the moment, our revenue stream is divided in direct hardware sales and recurring revenue per device. But the idea is to switch to a hardware as a service model very soon to remove those upfront costs. Since launching in 2018, we managed tenfold, doubled that the year after in 2020, and we hope to reach $300,000 of revenue in 2021. One of the KPIs we're really proud of in this slide is the repeat orders, which really prove that our solution is working for our clients and solving an issue they have. Concerning our clients, they're actually global and diverse. They span across several sectors, such as retails, telcos, banks, and even in industries we're working with aeronautics, cement plants, and even pharmaceuticals. Um, as an example, thanks to our solution, Orange was able to mitigate maintenance work by 60% and avoid 1,900 ton of CO2 equivalent. That's comparable to the energy usage in one year of more than 200 US homes. And with Safran, we've been actually able to reduce their energy usage by 20%. Compared to other existing solutions, such as OEMs, system integrators, or cloud-based actors, what now offers a complete, robust, scalable, and plug-and-play solution adapted to the realities and pain points of the emerging markets. Indeed, in these markets, a large amount of factories simply don't have any energy management system in place. So by using our own conceived and produced hardware, we can easily put in place such a system with deployment that can be made in less than a day. For the ones that are actually already monitoring their consumption, we can collect that data and run it through our algorithms to bring out the information and trends that matter in their specific industry. 
So in short, what makes us better, it's our data sets and algorithms. It's the fact that we are adapted to the pain points of the emerging market. And it's the fact that we can scale fast. Um, we've been able to do this with our industry leading team, combining electrical engineering and computer science professionals. And we're not going to stop right now because we're addressing actually a 4 billion market growing at 17% CAGR, specifically in the Middle East and African region. Um, we're talking at the moment with a certain number of strategic investors, and we're actually working on a long-term funding roadmap in the objective of preparing our Series A round. So in that sense, at the moment, we're raising $1.2 million to scale launch operations in new countries, set up IP, and even explore the B2C market. So in that sense, we would love to connect with you and tell you more about what we do at what now. So please do reach out so we can start acting today. Thank you very much for your attention. Awesome, and we actually have Malik here with us um, and we've got time for one to two questions. <laughs> Glad to be here. <laughs> Maybe, Welcome. can you break, great presentation, very interesting. Can you break down like per client, they use one of these hardware devices or how many, or, or, or is it possible that they use more than one? So how many clients at this point do you actually have? Okay, so uh, number of, <clears throat> sorry, number of clients, we're at around 30 clients at the moment. Concerning the actual number of devices we're going to implement in each of these clients, it's actually going to depend on the industries or the actual specific of the clients. So if we're talking about um, commercial buildings or so on, that would be around 20 devices that would be installed, more or less. And if we're talking industries, that really depends on the plant, that really depends on the factory itself. So uh, I don't know, like for cement plants, it can be hundreds and hundreds of devices. Mm -hmm. um, but we're actually uh, able to reduce the numbers of the devices deployed by using actually our, our algorithms. So we have an, like one of the one of them is called energy dis disaggregation, which actually cuts down the signal. So it it actually itself detects the um, the uses the use of energy of each uh, sort of uh, appliance. So we can actually reduce. That's why it's still very cost efficient, and we can reduce the numbers of devices deployed compared to uh, traditional actors or so on. So in the Carrefour in the Carrefour example, you would uh, deploy one of these devices in each uh, supermarket. Or... Yeah, I mean, no. If for for a whole supermarket, it would be maybe like ten devices or so okay, to okay. cover the whole sort of uh, range of it. Um, yeah, that's awesome. interesting. <laughs> yes, Malik, thank you again uh, for that. And remember that we'll we'll have some time afterwards to to have additional questions. So be ready for those. Yes, I will. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Great. Next up, we have Re3D. They are coming from the United States, a uh, post-seed company. They've raised about a million dollars so far. Uh, Re3D Inc. is committed to decimating the costs and scale barriers to industrial 3D printing. Let's check out the video. What if this water bottle could be transformed to be the chair that you're sitting on now? Or better yet, what if it could be used along with your local waste to make smart pallets or tools that your factories need? Hi, I'm Samantha, co-founder and catalyst for Re3D, where we are decimating the two biggest barriers to 3D printing, and that's cost and scale. You see, when you go to buy a plastic printer, this is the landscape. On one hand, there's desktop systems, which are great and affordable, but you can only make things you can hold in your hand. And on the other end of the spectrum are large industrial systems, but they're cost prohibitive, starting at 100K or more. This leaves a $37 billion market opportunity that is expected to quadruple in the next three years due to supply chain issues. Enter Gigabot. It's our flagship technology that's 30 times bigger than a desktop printer, but a fraction of the cost of the industrial equivalent because it starts at just under $10,000. Gigabot is sold across a whole host of services that allow you to test materials, designs, and prints prior to establishing printers on your factory floor, and they're supported by our maintenance and training plan. We launched Gigabot on Kickstarter during our participation in Startup Chile, and the response was huge. We were funded in 27 hours, instantly in 23 countries with a quarter of a million dollars. Equity free, we have taken our company to over $4 million in grants and awards, plus over $10 million in hardware sales and services. 
We're honored to be actively serving customers that we consider our accounts and friends and over 50 countries who are opening up new markets as they scale their operations using Gigabot. Our founding group of NASA engineers and creatives has grown to a team of experts with over 100 years of manufacturing experience that includes two advisors from Silicon Valley and an awesome dog. After exiting my first hardware company, I was privileged to recruit this amazing crew that is united by social responsibility. We have a one for 100 model whereby we give away one printer for every 100 we deliver to someone trying to make a difference in their community. And now we're here today talking to you at Web Summit with our ultimate vision, enabling Gigabot to 3D print from garbage. Seen here are three images taken outside of our office in Puerto Rico, and it's the same for wherever you sit today, where less than 10% of plastic waste is reclaimed. We sought to give that, home, that trash a home by directly enabling printing from shredded plastic waste to create products. And this is more than just an idea. Thanks to those grants and awards that we won, we have been able to make this a reality. And we are selling this product in beta, which should be in its final commercial form in just a couple months. It's already been sold across six countries during COVID, as well as three continents. And our customers are requesting bigger and bigger versions of this, as well as a whole host of services that allows us to grow with them. These are just a few organizations that have caught our vision who are printing with virgin or reclaimed materials as we speak. And now thanks to the support of this opportunity, by winning today, we would be able to further enable sustainable and locally driven manufacturing. Thank you. Awesome, and we actually have Samantha here with us. How are you? Good, how are y'all doing? Pretty good, welcome. All right, we're gonna open up the floor for the jury. Does anyone have any questions for Samantha and Re 3D Inc? Making sure. Somebody wants to go. I'm actually hoping you're going to ask me a question, Claudius. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I have many questions, but I thought I, I had to turn before, but I can go for sure. So you said you already have 9 million in revenue. Yes. That is it's just, um, just north of 10. Um, clearly, I needed to update that slide and forgot. <laughs> that, is, that is very impressive. So can you talk a bit more about the commercializ commercialization plans in the coming months? How is this exactly going to look like? Yeah, and I'll be looking forward to your, um, your feedback on this. Um, when I was creeping on your LinkedIn, I saw you had um, a past experience at Bellymus in, in automation. So um, one thing that's um, interesting about Re3D is you know, some of the early movers in this technology was defense and aerospace, and we were looking forward to meeting um, Airbus today if, if they had been on to chat with them more. But what we're finding is our, um, our customers that are super successful are often not the ones that um, united our social, our original social vision. Um, they're manufacturers worldwide, often making things that are non-sexy that you see every day that you don't think about. And um, those customers um, have purchased our printers that print with virgin materials. They were first movers and have grown with our portfolio as, as we've matured as a company. And they've given us feedback and say how to have an SLA and what customer support looks like as we've grown. As we've introduced this printer that prints from um, reclaimed plastic, what's interesting with the timing with COVID is they've seen opportunity now, as Daniela pointed out, with um, the accountability to their shareholders to reduce their supply chain. Also, all supp supply chains globally are disrupted. So they're looking at, for example, this is an OEM in Detroit automotive is lighting up. We were just there last week. This is a shipping cap. It goes on the back of one component. At this one OEM that makes one climate controlled component that then goes to a Ford vehicle, they throw out two to three thousands of these every day. They also access two pallets of water for their line workers. So they see opportunity to maybe create dunnage, which they're already having to import in at cost for their own shipping operations, or potentially to partner uh, with projects in Detroit or universities for practice-based learning to get an economic incentive um, to offer their own waste stream as a visible and a transparent opportunity to create things of local value and to create jobs. So we, we had our social model has uh, really come to a, an interesting point during COVID where we're seeing OEMs worldwide interested in using our technology internally, along with the printers that print with virgin materials they already use in conjunction with also looking at social opportunities to um, improve their supply chain and to be accountable to their stakeholders. So um, that's a long answer to say 
Um, we we um, were asked during COVID to put it in shipping containers. Um, and with that model now, we're looking to double our revenue this year. Excellent. And we've got time for one more question and then we'll open up the, the floor for, for the Q&A. If anyone has another question. Mm. So, so I have a question about that uh, recurring revenues. Uh, so what, what part of the, the, your revenues is uh, coming from recurring from, from the support? Yeah, um, um, we, we started introducing that model about five years ago. Um, so our customers buy extended warranties that renew as well as maintenance plans. So those OEMs that are our bread and butter, um, we get recurring revenue from them. That percentage right now, honestly, is um, between 10 to 20 percentage from ex, um, uh, this on-site maintenance and support, SLA, um, as well as um, they actually buy service plans. So when they hit 24 seven production, they might wanna have a plan with us to guarantee zero downtime um, if the printer goes down, um, as well as to take the extra burden that they might experience throughout the year or to do their materials testing when they're considering a new application. So that reduces their risk. And then we go and train them or make the customization to their printer. And what percentage of the, the your revenues comes The recurring from? revenue is around um, 10 to 20%. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rest of it is split with hardware sales and services. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Well, Samantha, thank you so much. Uh, you guys are doing some great work. Um, and very cool that you launched at South by Southwest. That's awesome. I'm from, <laughs> from Texas. So, you know, anytime we see see anything from Texas. We've got to go above and beyond the, the highlight that. <laughs> it's the startup Chile do, so they get all the credit. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very cool. Well, excellent. Now is the time. Um, we're going to open up the floor to the jury and reviewing the, 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 the startups that we've had today. So we've had EcoTree, EcoFi, what now in Re3D. So um, does anyone from the jury have any feedback specifically for any of the startups, or would you like to just give some general feedback? Yeah, maybe I can start. So uh, first of all, thank you, the four of you. These were great presentations, especially when I've uh, when I'm comparing them with uh, the presentations we had. Uh, yesterday. So they were really on point, most of them. Uh, very well presented, also in three minutes, you got it down to the gist. So uh, I was really impressed. And also sometimes when we're looking at the um, sustainability investment opportunities, it's always a bit the, the question whether we're talking about greenwashing or, the, or whether we're talking about actual yeah, an environmental solution. And I have the impression, of course, it's sometimes hard to charge within three minutes, but I have the impression that, that, that most of these solutions I've seen today, they were going in the right direction and actually have an impact on the environment and not only, well, telling it or pretending to. So this is great. And this is really interesting to see where this is going. Sometimes it's a bit hard also to judge like techn technological solutions like the Re3D, uh, how much did the, did the R&D cost? Uh, how uh, yeah, how um, profitable is this whole solution? But it's just super interesting. So uh, thank you very much for these presentations. Awesome, thank you for that. Okay, maybe I, I can go next. So yeah, I think uh, I agree with Claudius. Like uh, congrats to everyone, the presentation were really well made. Uh, if I can add just a point of feedback that I think it's very important, uh, the solution that you presented today, I think were like interesting, but pretty common. We saw a lot of platform and like to, to sustain like tree planting or like also a lot of platform that help corporates to evaluate their, uh, their environmental impact. So like when you're presenting those really try to explain very clearly in one sentence or two what makes a difference, why like the clients should choose you instead of your competitor. I think uh, this space is getting very crowded, luckily, because it means that we're all moving into 
the, the good side of technology, but of course for you it will be more hard and hard to differentiate yourself. So like when you are going to the market, I think this is something that you really should keep in your mind. So uh, the, the same here, thanks a lot, a great, great presentation. And uh, I would go in the same direction, like uh, Francesca said, that uh, what, what in some cases I was a little bit uh, uh, missing uh, was uh, uh, the focus on, uh, on the business side, yes, so, so better understanding of business model, like uh, pricing, and because it, 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 in some presentation it was already uh, like in Echo Tree, it was uh, touched some, some, but how 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 it uh, how is going to be sustain, sustainable in terms of a, uh, eco economy is, is also an important part of uh, evaluating by investors. This year. So that would be my hint. But but thanks. It was it was great presentation. It was great. It was very very good. All all good presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you, thank you to our jury, Arthur, Claudius, Francesca. Absolutely uh, great feedback, and and thank you to the startups that presented today. Um, you guys were were definitely on point, and I keep I continue to to keep learning about these really smart people who are creating some amazing platforms, technology, and solutions that are that, that are like really going to change the world. And so I'm, I'm honored just to, to be here and be able to watch you guys present. Uh, but that concludes the first uh, games for the day. And that's the end of the first session. So uh, we look forward to continuing the second part of the clean tech and smart energy startup session. And thank you again. And good luck. Good luck to everybody. Hello and welcome to the second part of the Clean Tech and Smart Energy session at the Founders Games of Webit Global Impact Week. Please welcome the jury that will give the teams their advice and feedback to the startups uh, while having the opportunity to strike their next deal. All right, so on the jury today, we have Marcin. He's a partner at Next Road Ventures. Welcome back, how are you? Thanks, I'm good. I'm, I'm really glad to be here again. Yes, glad to have you. And second, we have Sammy, a managing partner at Atmos Ventures. How are you, Sammy? I'm good, Jonathan. How's it going? Pretty good. Thank you. Thank you for your your participation. So we're looking forward to it. Um, and I'm just going to remind you guys in the audience about the the rules. So here's the rules of the Founders Games. Each startup has prepared a three minute video. We're gonna play that video and it's basically their pitch. And so after that three minutes is up or after their video is done playing, we'll open up a Q and A from the jury about three to five minutes. So um, there we're gonna ask some important questions that will help them with their evaluation uh, of the company and their decision process as they fill out their evaluation form um, they're going to be ranking the, the companies on a scale of one to 10 in five different milestones. So that's going to be team capacity, project scalability, business approach, marketing approach, and the uniqueness of the idea. So now that you guys understand the rules, we're going to get started. And the first startup that we have today is AgroNet Pro. They are based out of Poland and they've raised about 200,000 euros so far. AgroNet Pro is an IoT solution for smart agriculture. Let's check them out. Hello, I'm Sander from AgroNet, an agri-tech startup from Poland. About a year ago, I met a farmer who lost 80,000 euros due to local frost in his field. He asked me for a solution that he would next time wake up and be ready to save his apples. Most common reasons why farmers lose their yields are pests in the fields, frost and poor soil quality, as well as drought. Our solution is AgroNet Pro, a precision agriculture system. It consists of hardware, software, all connected to prevent risk and to manage costs. We just started from temperature sensors to help with frost prevention. But by now, we've already built 
14 different sensors and are now even looking at sensors to measure the growth of fruit. Our weather stations are distributed over the field. So you can have separate sensors in different places combining a better weather station. Our software consists of a web application and a mobile application. This way you can look into the history of your uh, sensors, uh, you can set your alarms and look, now there's a 0.1 degree frost near here. This is live data which I just can get from the application. As soon as we connected one farmer, all the farmers around him wanted to have the application. So we now already have a network of 100 farmers covering 20,000 square kilometers of farm field. As you can see from the market size, there's a huge growth potential. Our current customers are mainly in Poland, but also already in Belgium. And through our partners and with online sales, we want to put this solution in the hands of as many farmers in Europe as possible in, this, in a short time. Our advantages are that we integrate with local consultants and that our sensors are independent, making it possible to expand the system as you go and creating more solutions as you go. Our business model is clear. A yearly payment and a single fee payment for the hardware. Each sensor can be ordered separately. To be able to reach our goals, we have formed a very strong team with marketing and finance and IT experts as well as advisors which help us grow in the market. We want to grow fast, so new markets we're entering are Belgium, the Netherlands and France. And beside that, we use omnichannel marketing and partnerships to get our sensors out there. Help us, please let us if you can help us, please let us know. We will be very happy to work with you. Great. And we actually have Sander here with us. Hello. Uh, how are you? Welcome. Very good. Thank you. Excellent. So who has the first question for Sander? Can, can I start? Yes, of, of course. course. All right, Sander. Um, great to meet yeah. you. I have a question to you because there is a number actually of similar solutions on the market. If you can walk me through your secret sauce, sauce, actually, what makes you unique? What makes you stand out from the others? Yeah, a couple of things. So, uh, well, our, our biggest actually uh, competitor, I would say, is Sandcrop. It's a company from uh, from France, which has a similar solution, um, which are growing very fast. Um, um, but they depend, for example, just on Sigfox. And also their solution is, for example, not so much SaaS as our solution is. A lot of these solutions still require quite a lot of help from uh, consultants uh, to the farmers to be uh, become operational. In our case, you can start from a very, very small budget. So uh, you buy one sensor, one temperature sensor from which you can actually already get a very, a lot of data. You scan the sensor and that's it. Your sensor is working in the field without any installation needs for any um, um, any support from our side yes so it is uh, this is a very big difference i gave for example a um, a box of sensors to a big group of farmers and um, they got our sensors and we didn't get one telephone call to ask how we should install it and this was when our solution was really still very mvp i would say yes at the very start of our our um, our solution um, beside that, we have some unique things like wet temperature sensors, wet dry temperature sensors, which are very important for prediction of frost. Um, and also the solution we're building now, uh, which will be uh, ready in February, is a much more advanced solution than just sensing capacity. Yes, it will be uh, integrating local consultants with the farmers. And um, this means that uh, any uh, consultancy, fir consultancy firm can connect to this, use the solution, to inform their farmers, which they now all do per telephone, per email, um, and they can, uh, whenever there's a, whenever there's something happening in the field, they can straight away send out a, a communicate to say, well, you need to spray with this um, uh, with this chemical, for example, or do not spray with this chemical. And now this is happening all per phone and per email. Um, so yeah, so that's I think where we're unique. So. The complexity of the solution that is going to be in the market now, and I think we're unique in the in the sense that we're really, really SaaS, even with the hardware in the sense, you know, you can just get the hardware and you're up and running. There's no, 
there's no uh, complications there. Yeah. Sander, how, how many sensors do you have out there currently? Uh, there's about 400 sensors, sensors in the field now. 400 sensors in the field. And yeah. how much, how are they priced? Uh, they start from 70 euro per, per sensor. Okay. Um, and could you just maybe just, I know you touched on this, but what yeah. data are you, what type of data are you collecting and what type of insights can you generate from that data? Yeah. So we're collecting uh, temperature data. We're, that's that was we started with just only uh, actually uh, predicting frost, which is a big pain for farmers. It is, it makes them connect very fast to our system and want to have our system. Um, uh, Besides that, we collect uh, humidity, air humidity, soil quality, uh, soil um, temperature, uh, rain, um, uh, wind speed. And beside that, so all those temperature, all those things from the field, we have also one unique sensor, which nobody seems to have at the moment. It's an ethylene sensor, CO2 sensor, and O2 sensor to also track what's happening in the uh, controlled storage. And this is something uh, which is very important because as soon as the, the ethylene uh, goes up, it means that your fruit is getting ready to be sold or um, it, um, it spoils. So it is, uh, that's a very important sensor actually also. Okay. So, and, 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 and what's your plan to sell? Uh, you said you, you, are you looking to have resellers? Um, yeah, so, or... yeah. But mainly uh, um, uh, there's, th there's two things. One is a very strong online marketing. Yeah, so we have, we have a very easy way to get in. So you don't need us for that. Uh, so you have an on, uh, not, don't need us physically yet to, 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 to go uh, to the farmers. So we have a very strong online uh, sales capacity and mainly uh, through Facebook in Poland, for example, because uh, all the farmers are on Facebook as it turns out, and we know which groups they're in. And, um, and that's where we um, will advertise. Then um, uh, we also will sell a lot through consultants. So all farmers have a consultant to be able to know what they need to spray because uh, they, they don't know that it's so compl complex that they don't know that. So our solution also connects the consultant to the farmer. Um, um, and uh, so when the consultants take on our system, it means that all of their farmers will be using the system outright. Yes, just by, by being connected to their consultant. Um, and this means that they straight away can buy the modules. Uh, they can buy more sensors or they can um, uh, add a module for their spray book or for all of those things that are needed to manage the farm. So it's, it's a much more solution. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, no worries. Uh, I'm just, just paying attention to the time. And don't forget, guys, that um, the jury is going to be able to ask questions at the end of this if we have any additional questions. But, um, okay. Sandra, thank you. Thank you again for that. I actually live in Spain in El Ejido, and so I'm surrounded <laughs> by uh, the, the sea of plastic, they call ah. it. All, all of our friends from, from here grow uh, eggplant and, and bell peppers. Ah, and I see, I see. <laughs> so very, I've learned a lot about growing vegetables since we've been here. Um, <laughs> okay. But, but great. Thank you. Thank you again. Our next startup that's going to be presenting is EcoTree. So they are from Romania, their pre-seed company. They've raised about $700,000 so far. EcoTree is an all-in-one digital center for waste operations and recycling. Let's check out their video. Hello, my name is Bogdan. I am co-founder and CEO of EcoTree. And uh, our uh, mission is to make recycling easy. We've built a B2B waste management SaaS tool that will help companies be digitalized, 100% paperless, uh, help them uh, with the transparent and traceable waste management work. Our ambition is to become the leading digital tool in Europe and uh, gather a lot of data that will help companies and government entities take the best decision towards recycling. In Romania, in the past year, we've managed to gather more than 60 big waste service providers and uh, arrange, uh, put in order a lot of operation for uh, the biggest retailer here in Romania. And this is a map that shows how complex can be the digital operations in big company.
market service, uh, the waste services market in Romania is 1.7 billion euros. In Europe, it's 100 larger. And we address our uh, services to 60,000 companies, big enterprises in retail, uh, fast moving goods, auto, oil and gas, heavy industry, and so on. What are we delivering to our clients is a simple, intuitive interface where they can manage their relationship with their collectors and recycling facilities. They can find new ones. They can gather data, generate documents that are legally uh, required, and they uh, can keep track of their costs, their waste, their quantities, and so on. They can store the, their data in a single place, in a single database. They can report that data to operation, to authorities, to uh, audits, and so on. And all of that helps the, our clients, as they stated in uh, already, more than 80% efficiency in some of the operations. It's easy to use. You just in, enter our website, you choose your role, either you are waste collector or you produce the waste, you are a waste generator. We help you configure your account, uh, complete the data um, of your company, uh, users that are putting the orders and all the magic happens around a simple ordering system. In a few steps, you place your, your order at, at the other end is your service provider that is taking that order and uh, is completing it, all the other data are automatically dragged into it. And uh, this, this happens naturally, let's say. We are a strong team uh, formed of uh, members with more than 50 years of experience in their uh, field of work, such as marketing, IT, most of us, um, sales and so on. And we are together since 2017 when we started this project. And that says a lot of one, our uh, solid team that uh, has a clear objective of becoming a great company on Europe. Level. Last year, we took the first pre-seed investment. In September, we started the uh, testing phase. We've got in March this year, first clients and this September, um, we've got the second round of uh, seed investment with two clear objectives, product market fit and 100 clients in Romania by the end of next year. And uh, we are starting to go international uh, in the international phase. Our sales strategy is top down. We go to enterprise size clients, uh, SMEs uh, through marketing uh, and special projects uh, for households uh, through alliances. We've already managed to have more than 300 orders, more than 1,000 tons of waste uh, gone to the recycling facilities. Uh, we have three enterprise size clients, 61 collector and recycling facilities in Romania. The, this is a lot, it's almost 10% of uh, the entire market. And uh, we help to grow um, and help companies recycle more. The competition, the competitive landscape is at its start. The digital tools for recycling, transparency, and um, traceability is just starting. And we want to become one of the leading companies in this, uh, in this uh, field of digital recycling. There are bigger companies such as Rubicon, such as e-waste, part of uh, Vinci Group, Enevo, and so on. But uh, uh, there are a few and needs to be more. And we want to become one of them with our uh, intuitive approach towards clients. Thank you very much. Excellent. And so I know the, the video was a bit longer, so we've got time for one question. All right. So maybe Sami, I was first the last time, so the floor is yours. Okay, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, Bogdan, uh, I have one question to you. How much dependent is your solution on local regulations? Meaning today you operate in Romania, let's say you would like to scale your, scale your business to other country. 
how much how 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 much uh, market agnostic is the processor? How much regulate regulation agnostic is the product? And how much tweaking the product requires in order to bring it to another market? Thank you, thank you for the question. Hi, um, it needs to be a little uh, tweak uh, uh, for the local regulations, uh, but the framework, the European framework, is the same uh, at European level. So the principles that are guiding the waste management traceability, uh, most of the documents are the same. So we saw in Germany, for example, the workflow is very similar, 90% similar, for example, in Germany, what we've studied. In UK, it's a little bit different, for example, to, uh, it's 50% similar. I hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, thank you. Awesome, Bogdan. Thank you again, and and I think uh, in this session we'll we'll be able to have uh, a bit longer Q and A at the end for sure. Um, but next up, we have Wasteful from Bulgaria. Uh, and Wasteful is founded on the belief that recycled products should be simply beautiful, geeky, functional, and always provoking actions toward ourselves and our earth. Let's check out their video. Every minute, one garbage truck of plastic is being dumped into our oceans. With the current pace, they will be 2 by 2030 and 4 by 2050. We at Wasteful found a way to turn this mixed and contaminated plastic into beautiful construction products. One truck of plastic equals more than 6,000 euros worth in products. And there are more than half a million minutes in a year, so you do the math. Today we are presenting you a paper. It is made from Secondary plastic, secondary plastic, sand, and our special coating made from industrial waste. The material can be easily turned into bricks, roof tiles, facade elements, and so much more. Compared to the most common concrete paver on the market, our is 100% recyclable, two times lighter, and 97% to be exact, made from waste. In this big and big and conservative market, we are better in three very important aspects. CO2 efficiency, durability, and no microplastics when aging. Our unfair advantages are that we can have multiple products with one single material. Our secret sauce is the composite coating, and we can set up a mobile factory in just three days. Imagine this huge facility to fit in this shipping container. In addition, construction building products generate two streams of income. First, selling the paper to construction companies and developers and getting paid from recycling facilities. The European laws are forcing the businesses and the constructors to incorporate more and more recycled products in their projects. So we have calculated the market share for sustainable construction products in Europe and it's 3.3 billion. Our niche market for products made from waste is 66 million and it's constantly expanding. When selling the paper at 16 euros the square meter, we gain 7 euros in profit. We've made a progress so far and our go-to-market strategy is based on three steps. First, setting a pilot production for the paper, then optimizing the technology and diversifying the product line and setting a mobile factory and selling it as a franchise model. From left to right, first is Alex. Alex is our sales. Then it's me, Marta, I'm the marketing. Ivan is our visionary and Sasha is a PhD specialized in construction products. Our ask is 50,000 euro to finish our laboratory phase and 150,000 euro for the semi-industrial pilot production phase. Thank you very much for your time. Excellent. And I think we have Marta here with us. So who would like to start with questions? I'll go real quick. Um, you know, um, good question regarding the commercialization of this. Um, you said it's 16 euros per square meter. How does that compare to what's currently being used? May, go. Yeah, okay. it's about 25% more than the basic uh, paper that is the most regular. 
And is there a way to scale to lower that 25%, I'm assuming? Can you repeat the question? Excuse me, I didn't. You, know. I mean, you said it's 25% more. So I'm just saying over time when you scale, I mean, are, is there like a, a way to use economies of scale to lower that number? Yes, definitely. Uh, definitely, yes. It's a matter of, uh, uh, yeah, exactly scale of production and we can lower that price in time. And what about capacity wise? Let's say, you know, uh, you know, somebody is interested in, in using this, I don't know, to uh, for a certain application. Is it just a matter of kind of, is, it, is this more of a modular approach where you just kind of stack uh, the various kind of containers and for added scale? Is that how it works? Exactly. It's a, it's a modular approach, which uh, apart from being able to stack it in one factory and add modules, we can also uh, ship those modules, as Martin mentioned in her video, in, uh, in containers. So we can deal with the waste where it's needed because in construction materials and in pavers, a uh, big chunk of the price is formed from, from distribution. So construction companies and developers, they usually uh, almost always choose from the closest uh, source. Because construction companies for pavers currently, what are they using? Concrete. So like slag? No, uh, they're they're using just a normal normal concrete for uh, for the most common uh, common pavers in all all around the world. It's it's no uh, difference, uh, and that's why we want to uh, produce a paver that is made from um, waste waste products. So, I mean, it's then a question from my side. Construction, in, because as you mentioned in the presentation, construction industry is extremely conservative. So how are you actually planning to convince? constructors, construction companies to use your material? We have uh, a few few strategies that we, we're going to implement simultaneously. Uh, we have conversations which with uh, already, we have two confirmed and we are having more conversations with municipalities who are willing to, to give us test uh, fields, test fields like a street or a, a sidewalk to, to build that and uh, create the social proof and the yeah this is the social part but uh, the great thing is that uh, from my side i'm coming from the i have a, a design studio and alex in, is in the real estate business so our contacts uh, between from my side from architects and, and designers to be the first adopters because they are the people that are uh, taking and project uh, making the projects uh, for the constructors uh, we need to win them as a, as an ambassadors of our products. And next are the uh, clients of, of uh, Alex uh, with the real estate business. So this uh, will be the, the the early adopters in our in our project. And we already have a letter of intent from uh, from uh, clients that are interested to put uh, our products in their projects. Uh, last question, are there any tax benefits associated with using your product over concrete? Yes. On, on, the, CO2, on the CO2 emissions side, because actually uh, compared to the CO2 emissions, uh, for we are uh, 3.6 times lower compared to concrete uh, production in uh, compared our, our product to a, a, normal, a normal paper. So uh, it will be very, very much lower. And also the laws are, are changing. Uh, the biggest, uh, first is the CO2 emissions, but the biggest law from just from the beginning of this year was the export ban of uh, mixed and contaminated plastics in EU. So every country needs to deal with their own waste. Before it was just exported to, to third countries and they deal in some way with it. But now the, the countries have to deal with these waste streams by themselves and they don't have the infrastructure got it excellent well thank you thank you to the wasteful team um and yes any any additional questions we'll definitely be able to ask uh after after our last startup presents so thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. next up we have our create they are out of romania pre-seed company uh, our create is the first b2b digital platform offering packaging as a service for online stores. 
Let's check them out. Hello, my name is Linda from Recreate. And today I will present to you our business concept, which is the platform for usable packaging. We are obviously addressing the problem created by traditional packaging uh, of online orders. It is a pain point for both e-commerce and consumers, and it increases exponentially with COVID. The theoretical solution to counteract the waste is circular packaging, um, a package that is used more than once. And currently, all EU logistic and postal operators, uh, be it La Post, um, DHL, Swiss Post, are actually looking for solutions, um, different physical solutions. The environmental impact um, of using circular packaging instead of traditional packaging is huge. For example, with the packages we use, um, a pallet of cardboard can be replaced through the use of only 10 of them. EU regulation is pushing significantly down a single usage packaging, and this is why we think it is really the moment for usable packaging. We bring to the table package as a service through a system which is mapping standard delivery processes in different EU markets. We have identified two processes consistent with the market specificities for which um, we have a service. Um, for example, for Romania, um, most of the deliveries are done in home delivery. So we have um, created the closed loop process uh, together with uh, DPD Romania, in which the customer takes the order on spot out of the package and um, gives, it back, gives it back to the courier, which collects it and sends it back to the fulfillment center for a new waste usage. We think though that home de deliveries will be decreasing in the future. Therefore, we created another process, which is the open loop process, where the consumer is able to return the package to a collector collecting point, releasing thus the deposit associated with it. This is specific to European markets mostly, Western European markets. We have created these two processes by keeping in mind the key points of the stakeholders. The consumers want an easy process, easy return process, um, e commerce want a cheap solution to match the current prices of single usage packaging, and the logistic operators want efficiency. So, how does the open loop process look like? Well, in essence, it brings the standard deposit refund scheme for pets, for example, in the digital age. That is, the customer opts in on the website of our partner store, deliver, um, the delivery is received in the reusable packaging. The consumer decides then when, whether um, they keep or not the product and returns the package within a certain um, period of time to a collection point. Um, in that moment, the deposit on the package is released. In order to make this process work, uh, we need, of course, a dense enough network of collection point, points integrated within the consumer daily itinerary, such as postal lockers or um, retail chains, retail stores. What is important is that we know that classical deposit refund schemes do work. Um, they have a 91 collection rate uh, in Europe. We are able to offer package, package as a service for um, the processes described before because of our technological platform. Um, this technological platform is interfacing all the players in the system. We charge e-commerce is a fee per usage, and we distribute a part of it to the package producer and to the logistic operator that is collecting the, and creating the return. For the customers, it is planned as a free of charge process. So we are actually offering to e-commerce an end-to-end -end service, which includes package sourcing, automated return process, and of course, reports on the savings of CO2, which is actually the reason why we have the product in the first place. Uh, we create a lot of operation. Our platform is actually um, using a lot of processes, creating a lot of processes, which with the help of smart tech are reaching efficiencies that allow us to charge at par with the budget currently spent for single usage, which is very important because there are a lot of startups, actually most of them in Scandinavia, Repack, Akorang, Recip, which are currently patenting different physical solutions. The problem with these solutions is that they're still a premium product for the loyal customers. 
We want to therefore call ourselves complementary to these guys as we are focusing on, on really bringing the scale through a cheap and automated process. So who we are, um, as you can see, a team of professionals coming mostly from business and e-commerce backed up by angel investors, which are supporting us in specific uh, topics. We see Romania as our sandbox. Uh, we have finalized the platform for the closed loop process, uh, implemented it with Carturesh, the biggest uh, bookstore, online bookstore. We have an adoption rate somewhere between 10 and 20%. And uh, for a month, we have a partnership with TPD Romania that we are uh, planning to, to use next year for scaling in Romania. But actually, for the future, we would like to focus on the open loop process. Um, as you can see here, we are able to cover more or less all the verticals from e-commerce, uh, so we can really reach scale. But um, for the version two, for the open loop process, what we need to do is to create a platform, to create the development, to make an MVP, which shows that, that there is market adoption and therefore scale at the EU level. For this, we plan to, to raise uh, 350,000 euros, um, actually. We are now looking for partners, test clients and mentors. So the question is, are you willing to go with us into the journey? All right, thank you. And um, we're gonna have to reduce it down just to one question and then we'll open it up to uh, the, the open jury, just the video was, was detailed, which is good. Um, so who has that, that one question or who wants to start? All right, so I mean, it can be me. Uh, I have a question to you about your open loop system because you were with your open loop approach, you were actually adding quite a lot of friction to the whole e-commerce experience because you were requiring the, actually the buyer to make additional step. So how is your, actually what's your plan on building the density of the collection points? Because it has to be as convenient as possible. And I guess it will requ require loads of legwork actually in order to build the density. So, and are you planning to build it city by city or you are like just running some sort of countrywide campaign? Uh, thank you for that question. It is indeed the key uh, point of, of having a valid uh, uh, deposit refund system. And the answer, the quick answer to that is we will not build it up ourselves. We will look at um, things which are already in place, meaning um, you have two types of systems which are more or less covering everything. It's the retail chains, and we are discussing with one of the retail cha biggest retail chains in Romania for that. Uh, and second, it's uh, locker systems. And, and I think as you have in Poland, we also have in Romania a pretty big player, which is covering more or less um, the whole country. And we are uh, also discussing with them. So in, in, in short, locations exist. The question is just plug them into the system. Excellent. Well, Linda, thank you for that you. Um, very, very cool idea. Uh, I, I like it personally and, and would love to to explore more of the company. Um, now, since that was the last presenter for, for this session, we wanna open it up. Uh, we've got time so we can, we can keep it open for about 10 minutes. Just to review again, the companies that presented, we had Ecotree, Eco5, uh, Wasteful, and R-Create. So if you guys have any questions for them, uh, any comments in general, that you want to give back yeah, to uh, that, that, that you, Oh, Agronet. Oh, I'm sorry. That's my fault. I don't know why I didn't see that. Okay, well, my mistake. And I'm glad you're here. So the floor is open for, for the jury. If you guys want to give feedback, now is the time or any more questions for, for any of the presenters. Guys, unfortunately, on my side, I have a hard stop in one minute because I have another commitment. So... I mean, it was great actually to be here. It was great to listen to your uh, to your presentations. Fingers crossed, and all the best actually in developing your uh, your, your ideas because I mean they're really brilliant. All right, I, I can I can pick up uh, the slack from Martin. Um, so that's all good. So so Linda, um, quick question regarding our create. Um, how would a relationship look like if you partnered with, let's say, uh, an Inpost or some of those guys? How, how would that look like? Well, what we are trying to do is really to stay very slim, meaning that we just want to do technology. So 
if we would partner up with the uh, locker owner, let's say, um, they would basically receive a fee each time they collect a bag. So they would, it is basically, we are administrating a system um, and split up the money um, to people which are entities which own assets, be it the ones which own the boxes, the collection boxes, which have to have certain capabilities and so on, and to the ones that own the packages. More or less, that's how it would work. So our platform would just distribute and pay them for what they do for us. All right, got it. Um, Agronet, uh, Sander. Yeah. I, I, I'd like to learn a little bit more about, you know, do, do you have, let's say, a, a euro amount on, you know, the problem associated with frost or certain, you know, some of those other issues that you've come across? You, you mean uh, uh, what what farmers can uh, say with this or something or, or I don't mean what don't I mean know what let's mean. say let's let's say I mean there's obviously you're obviously preventing a lot of damage associated with frost mm -hmm. ah yes, yes so yes. my question is how much how much of a problem is that well uh, that's that's actually why we grew so quickly in the beginning we could not uh, actually keep up uh, uh, yeah it, it, it came out of just a conversation about about frost and and when I connected that one farmer up, all the farmers around connected to it because the problem are twofold. One is uh, they need to spend nights uh, driving around all their fields checking uh, the temperature because the temperature is very different be between one field and another. Um, uh, so it can be 100 meters further. It can be a different type of frost. That's why the low cost sensors are also sensors are also very important. And if they lose one yield, you can uh, well, it's you know per hectare it could be 40, 50 thousand euros. Yes. So that's the kind of loss you can have. Um, that's actually the real loss that the farmer that asked me for the solution, which is also, by the way, part of the team, um, and he had an 80,000 euro loss that year. And was that year. covered by insurance? Is that covered by insurance companies? No, or? very often not, because that insurance is only available for two minutes per year or something. And if you then uh, are able to get it, then you're very lucky. Yeah, so it's not like you can easily cover that with insurance. Insurance would be also far more expensive than uh, then um, uh, preventing it uh, by knowing when the frost is and then switching on the water. And my last question is that, I mean, you know, you are, you are targeting the B2C aspect. What are the B2B implications that you can target on the business development side? It is, it is actually B2B because farmers are B2B, yes? So we are, we are, we are um, actually, uh, uh, um, well, it's B2B business. So the farmers are, are a business and we are a business. But um, uh, it, what is key, Actually, in our whole uh, uh, um, whole solution is that well, it's not uh, just frost, by the way. But what's also key is that we have a partner, uh, Rimpro, uh, um, who um, the owner of Rimpro, who has invested in us, who has a market all around the world, yes, already, and it is a very very uh, well known uh, brand. And so uh, we are tagging along with this, and so that's why we can grow very quickly. And that is our um, those partners of ours are very strong. So Rimpro and, and in Poland, Robert Sass, who is, a, is one of the major consultants in Poland for farmers, which has a very large network of farmers. And with them, we're going to the market. And that's, that's I think, most important. So those, those B2B relations are very important when we talk about B2B. Got it. Uh, Bogdan, uh, regarding Ecotree, what's your strategy for, um, I, mean, I mean, the way I see it, um, you are kind of, you know, using technology to make, uh, you know, a complicated process pretty simple. Um, but, you know, you, there are some competitors in the space. These are pretty large companies. Um, you know, the way I see it, um, and, and, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, that the value lies in the network that you end up creating. Correct? That's right. So, so my question to you is, how do you plan on creating that network quickly um, at home as well as in the European countries? Thank you for the question. Um, so uh, we are focusing, that's, um, that, uh, that's answers by the, our strategy, focusing on the big enterprises. So uh, the, the answer lies there because big enterprises will, will help us uh, scale more and they enforce their suppliers to create this network that you are talking about. So basically what happened here in Romania, all the co contracts that uh, we signed uh, to these companies, uh, they enforced to their collectors 
to work with us. So now in the RFQs, in the request for uh, proposals in them, uh, for them asking uh, waste collection services, they just put there uh, to work with the digital platform uh, that will uh, manage the operations. So we be so Echo Tree becomes the standard uh, for. <laughs> okay, all right. I understand. I understand now. Okay, that makes sense. I mean, look, that's cool. If you're able to build out that network quickly, um, in an efficient way, um, you know, I can see that being of of great value. Um, so you know, more power to you if you're able to do that. Um, how much time do we have? We can probably go for another three to five minutes. Okay, um, waste, let's, let's jump to wasteful real quick, guys. What what would you say is your biggest bottleneck um, of trying to achieve what you'd like to achieve? I mean, you guys are raising a pretty. I mean, the amount isn't that big um, right now, but I'm just trying to understand. You know, if you want to get to where you want to get, do you feel that you'd need to raise more money initially? That is true, uh, absolutely true, because the the construction business, and that's why we from the beginning of of our company, we wanted to go with the construction because large amounts of waste needs to be put in large amounts of uh, infrastructure. And uh, this is the, uh, the thing that we are aiming for. And the biggest bottleneck will be first, uh, the conservative industry of construction to pursue them to, to use our materials and then also to distribute the, the machines where they are needed. Because uh, in the end, if we have um, uh, the mobile factories first here, here in uh, Bulgaria and in Europe, uh, it's okay. But uh, on the other side of the world where um, there is a lot of waste and um, missing of uh, infrastructure, uh, this will be the, the biggest, let's say, challenge because um, it's important to, to bring a lot of, of tools to the people to turn the, the waste into infrastructure. This is our biggest, biggest aim because the, the material is there, but they lack, uh, they lack the tools to turn it into something uh, um, feasible and, and important for them. This is, this is very, very hard. Got it. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand, like, you know, I, I, I like the idea very much. The question is, you know, these guys are just, you know, construction companies are super bureaucratic, you know, margins are super, super tight. You know, how do you convince them to, you know, to really kind of take this on? And that's why I asked you the question initially about, you know, the tax implications and whatnot. Like, is this an easy sell for them? Um, or, you know, you know, do you have to convince them otherwise? I mean, these guys are, you know, on really, really strict budgets. So how can you make it appealing to them to kind of, you know, speed up what you guys are trying to achieve? I will, I will answer this uh, in two parts. Uh, first, because they are quite bureaucratic, they are quite practical as well. So in the conversations that we've had with them, uh, they've been really clear on what uh, characteristics they want to, uh, we, uh, we have to achieve what technical specifications of the product they need and at what price and they are able that they, they're happy to try it. So they, they, they've set us a really clear uh, goals uh, in terms of the parameters of the product. Yeah. Uh, so if we meet that, we'll, we'll use it. If you, if you can give us uh, something that will last that much, we'll uh, weigh that much will look similar to this at that price I'm happy to use it uh, and on the second part uh, together with the with the co2 uh, emissions emissions which Ivan uh, spoke about earlier uh, regulations are coming in place about implementing uh, recycled materials into projects as well and this percentage of recycled materials is set to to get bigger in the next year so companies will be looking into what can we implement into a product that will, that is recycled it would be just just one last thing it would be really cool if you guys would be able to perhaps create some type of tech you know tech modular that can maybe you already have it that can you know a turnkey solution where you can go to us you can go to a construction company you tell them look use our stuff um you know you plug in all this 
type of stuff based on this, you know, law in the EU, this is exactly how much you're going to save and you can claim it through us, you know, just to make it easier for them because, you know, um, they'll tell you, oh, yes, we can save X amount. And but, you know, by the time we file it, et cetera, like these things are always a bit of an issue. So if you can maybe solve that bureaucratic, um, let's say, hurdle uh, with a click of a button, um, that could be pretty cool. That's that's a great uh, suggestion. We'll take it. You're the first person to to point to, to spotlight uh, this one. So thanks. Got that. Good. Excellent. And at, right before we wrap up, I had a quick question that you guys focused on um, anything with the luxury market. Could you sell this to people who are not so focused on reducing cost, but more about the the, the environmental impact or uh, in, in this area of, uh, or southern Spain or something, you see a lot of construction companies building these luxury homes and they're they're using more eco-friendly materials and so they they're also getting a much higher margin because of the the products that they're using so is there a a luxury market for this that could help um to to focus in the same space but but focused on on luxury yes if i can answer uh First, uh, our papers uh, can be used as a mosaic element. It, uh, uh, yeah. Pictures or logos can be drawn and seen from an eagle's eye. And also, we have to develop a second element, uh, which is also, we have uh, isolation quality is very good. And they can also be used as, as a mosaic element. So it, on a building, you can draw a picture or a pattern and, to, and use it as a spotlight also as a, yeah. And as we as we know, the Roman mosaic station, Roman mosaics were, were the, the thing that people uh, try to preserve the, the best. They don't preserve, uh, let's say, just the, the normal world, but something that has an artistic value. So uh, that's why. Excellent. Yeah, I, I, so many ideas for you guys. I'm, I'll, uh, I wanna shoot you an email very very interesting but thank you all uh to the companies that participated today we're going to wrap up and thank you to the jurors that were here and great feedback I, I think these sessions are getting better and better as we go uh i loved the way this one went and so great companies um and i wish you all luck and thank you again for being here today so um, that concludes this session, and this is the last startup um, for the session. And so now we're at the end of the clean tech and smart energy. Um, and next, we're going to be entering the AI, big data, and analytics startup session. So we'll see you next in that one.